Rupert Murdoch's media empire is engulfed in a growing scandal after new evidence emerged that his reporters in Britain paid corrupt police officers for story tips and hacked the voicemails of thousands of people, from child murder victims to politicians to the families of British soldiers killed in war. On Thursday, Murdoch shocked the country by shutting down the newspaper at the center of the scandal, the News of the World, Britain's biggest-selling Sunday newspaper. The paper was founded in 1843. Its final edition will be this weekend. Earlier today, uh, one of the former journalists at the paper, Andy Colson, was arrested on corruption and phone hacking charges. Colson's arrest has put the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, in the spotlight. Up until January, Colson was Cameron's director of communications. Cameron hired him despite allegations that he played a key role in the phone hacking for Murdoch. Details about the phone hacking scandal have been known for years, but public outcry intensified earlier this week when The Guardian newspaper revealed that in 2002, journalists working for Murdoch hacked the voicemail of a missing teenage girl named Millie Dowler while police were looking for her. She was later found murdered. An investigator from News of the World reportedly listened into and deleted messages for the cell phone of this 13-year-old girl. The actions of the journalists hampered the police investigation of the girl's death and gave false hope to her family that she was alive. The investigative journalist Nick Davies of The Guardian has broken several of the key stories on the scandal. In this video posted on The Guardian's website, Davies talks about the Millie Dowler case. We at The Guardian got hold of two separate sources who told us independently that one of the victims of this illegal voicemail hacking was the 13-year-old Surrey schoolgirl Millie Dowler, who we now know was abducted and murdered. And we discovered that during the period of time when she was missing and there was no explanation for what had happened to her, the news of the world were using a private investigator to listen to her voicemail. Now, that in itself was, was horrid, because you're talking about a period when her friends and family are calling her on her mobile phone and are terribly worried about her, and they're imploring her to come home, and they're crying on the phone, and it's deeply personal stuff, and they hear the news of the world listening to it. That feels wrong. But where it then got worse was that the voicemail box on Millie's phone filled up. The news of the world were hungry for more information, for more stories, so they intervened and deleted the messages. Well, of course, for the family and friends who were calling in and who had heard that the voicemail box was full, suddenly it wasn't full anymore. So naturally enough, they concluded that Millie herself had deleted her messages. Therefore, she was still alive, and she wasn't. The Millie Dowler story changed the politics of the whole saga, and it made it really impossible for anybody to defend the news of the world, and that included the Prime Minister and the Tory leadership. And so they've, so to speak, switched sides. They've switched sides specifically on the question of whether or not there should be a public inquiry. And David Cameron, in fact, announced not just one but two public inquiries, one into the long-term and shocking failure of the Metropolitan Police to get anywhere close to telling the truth about this until very recently. And the second is into the misbehaviour of the news of the world and the media generally. I think it's reasonable for any of us to observe that the Murdoch Corporation has too much power. It's evident from the way in which the police, the Press Complaints Commission and some politicians automatically backed off and said, let's not cause trouble, they might hurt us, that they already had too much power when all this was going on. It seems to me highly unlikely that it could be in the interests of our society as a whole to give that too powerful group yet more power. Okay. Uh, that was reported Nick Davies of The Guardian newspaper. Rupert Murdoch's media empire is being shaken at a time when he is attempting to pull off a $12 billion takeover of the TV network British Sky Broadcasting. Earlier today, Britain's culture secretary announced that, that uh, the decision on the Sky deal will be delayed because of the ongoing scandal. It's unclear what impact the British scandal will have on Murdoch's U.S. media holdings, which include the Fox TV network, the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones and Company, HarperCollins, and the 20th Century Fox Film Studio. To talk more about the scandal, we're joined by Ryan Chittam in Seattle. He writes about the business press for Columbia Journalism Reviews, The Audit. So, late this out. This story is remarkable. It has been unfolding for years and involves everything, including a guy being paid off. They talk about corrupt police officials um, who, in fact, was a suspected axe murderer to hack these phone mails. Explain what's going on, Ryan. Yeah, as you said, this has been unfolding for years. It really became a big story 
in 2009 when Nick Davies, who we just heard, um, broke the news that uh, News Corporation had paid off some of the victims of uh, the phone hacking in order to keep them from pressing uh, charges and, and uh, investigating further what had gone on. He broke that, and it still wasn't a big story in the British press. You know, the other tabloid papers didn't follow it. It's kind of been a lonely, um, you know, journey for Nick Davies and The Guardian over the past two years. They've had some help, um, you know, from papers like The Independent and the BBC and then, you know, The New York Times, even in the, United, in the U.S. But the Millie Dollar thing is what really took this to another level. It exploded it into you know, a huge story that nobody could ignore, including the Murdoch Papers, like the Times of London, the Sun, you know, the Wall Street Journal. And the fact that uh, uh, David Cameron uh, hired as a communications secretary one of the former editors at the center of this scandal. Could you talk about the this uh, incestuous relationship between uh, key officials uh, of the Murdoch empire in Britain and, and the Murdoch family itself, and both the the uh, the conservatives and the Labour Party leaders uh, in Britain over over these many years. All right, Andy Coulson was the editor of the News of the World, not during the Millie Dollar case. He was deputy then, but during most of the hacking allegations. And uh, David Cameron knew when he hired him that News of the World had some sort of trouble. He you know clearly didn't know the extent of the trouble. But the editor of The Guardian sent word that um, Colson was involved in some of these other things, and uh, Cameron just denied that this morning. But I think the big story here, beyond the criminality of this newsroom and what it says about the culture of News Corporation, which is the, you know, the biggest and most important media company in the world, is what it says about the power of that company and media consolidation. Murdoch owns some one-third of the newspapers in Britain, and I, uh, uh, like the second biggest TV proprietor. So he has a huge impact on that society. And uh, what this scandal has exposed is police corruption, government corruption, um, media cooperation. You know, it's, it's really kind of... Um, a revealing story about how media consolidation can be a corrupting factor in society. Ryan, we want you to give us the chronology of how all this unfolded. But first, let's play Rupert Murdoch's son, James Murdoch, what he has to say, News International's chairman. Uh, the scandal has thrust him into the role of crisis manager. In an interview with the UK Telegraph, James Murdoch defends his colleague Rebecca Brooks, chief executive of News International. He also blames the scandal on a few rogue actors. Fundamentally, actions taken a number of years ago by certain individuals in what had been a good newsroom have breached the trust that the news of the world has with its readers. I am satisfied that Rebecca, her leadership of this business, and her standard of ethics and her standard of conduct throughout her career are, are very good. And I think what she's shown and what we have shown with our actions around transparently and proactively working with the police. Recall, it's the process of information discovery that we went through proactively and voluntarily that actually started these investigations to be opened again by the police earlier this year. You know, I am satisfied that she neither had knowledge of nor directed those activities. Ryan Chittam, your response. Um, talk about the significance, uh, her significance. Uh, was this scandal investigated uh, only because News International internally took the initiative? Where does she fit into the story? And what does she mean also for Fox global empire, including media in the United States? No, that's completely false. And you can't believe a word these people say at this point, um, if you ever could. I mean, this story came out because of reporting by The Guardian almost exclusively in Nick Davies and the push for investigations by victims of, that, of the hacking scandal didn't come about because of News Corporation, who tried to cover it up at every point. There's, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. 
Rebecca Brooks, uh, when she was editor of the New York uh, of the News of the World, I mean, think about this. She had an axe murder suspect on her payroll. Rupert Murdoch did, um, hacking the phones of people, violating their privacy. She'll say she didn't know that they were doing these Ill illegal activities, but as anybody who's worked in journalism knows, especially somebody who's had power, you don't let something in the paper, sensitive things, unless you know where it came from. So it's implausible that she didn't know this stuff. And, um, and the same with Andy Coulson, who's now under arrest, I suspect. <laughs> Brooks will be before too long. Andy Coulson, the former spokesperson uh, for Cameron, the prime minister of Britain. Right. This is, I mean, imagine Robert Gibbs, you know, uh, Obama's spokesperson, if, if he was under arrest now f for these, you know, widespread crimes committed under his watch. I mean, it's just, um, it's, it's an amazing story. And the fact that this investigator was on the payroll, I think, at 100,000 pounds a year, uh, you would think that some editor uh, would at least question, hey, uh, what's this? What are we paying this guy to do? Uh, it's, it, as you say, it seems well, right. uh, completely inconceivable that the editors would not know uh, what was going on in this situation. And if they didn't know, they should be fired well, for not knowing that there was a criminal well, another, operation. Uh, another their fascinating newsroom. Right. A fascinating thing that's come out this week about Rebecca Brooks is that back in 2002, um, they had News of the World Resources, a van, a couple journalists, tail the lead detective on that axe murder case. Who's, who's re it was a 15-year-old case. They reopened it. He went on uh, the TV, and then um, the News of the World had him followed. Now, they were caught following him after the detective called Scotland Yard, and they said, oh, we're, we're investigating whether he's having an affair with a news anchor. He'd been married to her for five or six years, had a couple kids. So totally bogus. The Scotland Yard went to Rebecca Brooks' complaint. She uh, fought them back. They never did anything about it. She never did anything about it, continued to employ this guy. So the, the idea that they're saying that she didn't know what was going on is just it's ludicrous and, and she may have like, not known all the details yeah and this whole, this whole knew, situation uh, uh, she created the culture that was going on yeah i wanted to ask you about the police involvement in this and uh that the newspaper was paying uh police for uh uh, internal documents or records, uh, the the degree to which police officials and the investigation that needs to be conducted uh, within law enforcement on the, this cozy relationship of actually getting paid bribes uh, to to uh, release documents to a particular newspaper. Right, and this is part of that corruption of society, you know, with the media consolidation. I was talking about earlier. I mean, the police were not only had um, people on the take from News Corp, but, you know, they were afraid of Murdoch. They had this symbiotic relationship with the News of the World where they would leak things to it and, you know, the News of the World would drum up sympathy for police cases and against, uh, you know, alleged criminals. And they didn't want to da uh, damage that relationship. So you had that going on. and. Probably they knew that some of their people were on the take. They didn't want that exposed. So between those two factors and, and Lord knows what else, um, they covered it up. I mean, the investigation that they had into this was a joke. Um, with this widespread um, criminality going on, and the, and the news of the world didn't even hide this. Its competitors did some of it, but it was most systematic. But, you know, you could read the paper and see that there was no other way that they could have gotten these messages than Rupert hacking Mur into them Rupert illegally. Murdoch has remained noticeably silent on the hacking scandal. In a July 2009 interview with Fox News Business, the media mogul abruptly cut off an anchor who inquired about the controversy at News of the World. All around the country, and certainly here in New York, is that the News of the World, a news corporation newspaper in Britain, no, used— I'm not, I'm not talking about that issue at all today. I'm sorry. Okay. No worries, Mr. Chairman. There you go. Of course, Fox owned by uh, Rupert Murdoch.